Whether you're getting ready for registry or just want to be a seasoned provider, you're going to need to understand shock. So let's break it down. Shock was one of those topics in school that I struggled with. I was trying to memorize vitals and signs and symptoms, and then there was categories and types and stages of shock, and I would sit in front of a test, and it was just a confusing blur of data. Then I realized I was learning shock wrong. I was trying to memorize everything rather than understand it. So we're going to create a five-part series breaking down shock so you can understand it. In this part, we're going to talk about the categories and stages of shock, and then in the next four videos, we're going to break down the categories of shock and look at the individual types of shock. So let's start with categories. We know that oxygen makes it to the cell via the bloodstream. It leaves the lungs, goes into the blood, the heart pumps that blood, and then it distributes it out through all the, all the blood vessels. And that's how oxygen makes it from the lungs to the cells. Categories of shock are organized by which part of that system's failing. If you're low in blood, it's hypovolemic shock. If there's a problem with the pump, it falls into the category of cardiogenic shock. If there's a problem with the blood vessels, it falls into the category of distributive shock. And if all of those are, those are working, but something's keeping them from being able to deliver that oxygen, it falls into the category of obstructive shock. So the categories of shock are pretty simple, right? But each category has types of shock. And that's going to be the topics for the next four videos. Right now, we're going to move over into the stages of shock. So there's three stages of shock. There's compensated, decompensated, and irreversible. And it helps if you don't think of them as individual stages, but more of a spectrum that the patient falls on. Now in compensated shock, we know that the body has mechanisms to keep that oxygen flowing to the tissue. Those mechanisms that we talk about in shock are generally respiratory rate, heart rate, and vasoconstriction. All these mechanisms make sure that the body has enough oxygen when there's a problem with the cardiovascular system. So the body increases its oxygen intake by increasing the respiratory rate. It's that simple. Don't get hung up on a pulse ox. If a patient has to breathe 30 times a minute to maintain a normal pulse ox, that's still a compensation mechanism. It doesn't mean that there's not a problem and it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't need oxygen. The patient should be able to maintain a good pulse ox with a normal respiratory rate. We know the heart ejects blood with each contraction, about 70 milliliters, and that's called stroke volume. Let's say a patient has a normal stroke volume of 70 with a normal heart rate of 70. That equals 4,900 milliliters of blood per minute. Now, if this patient starts to lose volume, and let's say their stroke volume drops down to 50, and their heart rate increases to 100 to maintain that, we went from 4,900 milliliters a minute to 5,000 milliliters a minute. Now, the seasoned provider is going to recognize that the patient's in shock long before they get that drop in blood pressure. Matter of fact, this is why a lot of patients in early hypovolemic shock will get a small increase in blood pressure. Because initially, when they were moving 70 milliliters per contraction at 70 beats a minute, it was 4,900 milliliters. Now it's at 5,000 milliliters, but the heart rate's 100. So the pressure didn't drop, but the heart rate increased to 100. Now let's say that stroke volume drops down to 40 and the heart rate increases to 115. We're at 4,600 milliliters of blood. Still, no significant drop in blood pressure, but the patient's presenting with an increasing heart rate. Unless you can justify that increasing heart rate, you can assume the patient's in compensated shock and the heart rate's increasing to maintain that pressure. Then we have vasoconstriction. So how's that patient present? Well, the skin color and temperature is affected by the amount of blood that's going through the skin. Whenever the body shunts that blood to the core, we lose blood flow to the skin. When we lose blood flow to the skin, it's going to become cool and pale. We also have these muscles in our skin that are constantly holding back sweat. If there's no blood flow to the skin, these muscles stop receiving oxygen and they fail the skin becomes wet. So next time you see a patient in a scenario or real life with cool, pale, diaphoretic skin, don't think of it as a box to check. You should be asking yourself, why is the body electing to shunt blood to the core? Now, as we cross into decompensated shock, these mechanisms may or may not still be attempting to maintain pressure, but they're not able to. So a lot of times you'll still have the cool diaphoretic skin, the increased respiratory rate, the increased heart rate, but now the blood pressure is starting to drop. Once a patient's in decompensated shock long enough, they move on the spectrum towards irreversible shock. Now, other than the test, 
irreversible shock is kind of irrelevant in the EMS setting because we have no clinical way to diagnose the patient as being an irreversible shock. So from a treatment standpoint, we're only worried about compensated and decompensated. The only reason I bring up irreversible shock is because it's a common question on national registry. Okay, I want to go over some test questions with you so we can kind of apply what we learned, but let's do a quick recap. If there's a problem with the amount of blood, it falls into the category of hypovolemic shock. If there's a problem with the pump, it falls into cardiogenic shock. If there's a problem with the blood vessels, it falls into distributive shock and if there's some problem keeping them from doing what they're supposed to do it falls in the category of obstructive shock we're going to go over some questions here and they're going to seem pretty simple but that's because if you've watched this far into the video you understand the categories and the stages of shock but we're not just going to read the questions and wait for the answer we're actually going to dissect why the wrong answers are wrong and why the right answers are right question number one which of the following is another way of describing the condition of shock Internal bleeding, hypotension, low perfusion, or hemorrhage. Well, we know internal bleeding and hemorrhage both lead to the same thing, and that's hypovolemia. Shin's asking about shock as a whole. We know that that's one specific category of shock called hypovolemic. Now, hypotension just refers to what stage of compensation the patient's in. So low perfusion is going to be the answer. Now, I changed the wording on this because normally National Registry says hypoperfusion, and that's absolutely accurate, but I'm more worried about you understanding concepts than exact vocabulary. So if you answered C, you were right. Is going Number two, underlying causes of distributive shock is inadequate fluid intake, loss of blood volume, poor cardiac contractility, or dilation of the blood vessels. Well, one and two fall into what category? I hope you guessed hypovolemic. Poor cardiac contractility would fall into what category? You got it, cardiogenic. So that only leaves one thing, dilation of the blood vessels. Now there's several different causes or types of shock that cause a dilation of blood vessels like sepsis, anaphylaxis, and neurogenic, but they all fall into the category of distributive shock. Number three, which of the following is a top priority for a patient in shock? determining the cause of shock, spinal immobilization, proper patient positioning, and ventilatory support and oxygen delivery. You need to determine the cause of shock to treat it, but it's not our top priority. And while spinal immobilization is important, we know that it doesn't take precedence over airway, breathing, and circulation. Patient positioning helps, but, no, but none of these trump ventilatory support and oxygen delivery, because we know at the end of the day, no matter what type of shock the patient has, they're not getting enough oxygen to the tissue. So anything we can do to increase and supersaturate that blood with oxygen is going to help. Number four, a myocardial infarction may lead to what category of shock? It's okay. I'll wait. You got it. Anaphylaxis causes widespread vasodilation leading to what category of shock? Well, let's review the four categories. We have blood, hypovolemic, pump, cardiogenic, blood vessels, distributive, and obstructive, everything else. Anaphylaxis is causing a widespread vasodilation, so that goes into the category of distributive. Significant burns can lead to massive fluid shift. The loss of this fluid will lead to what category of shock? Now, most of the time we associate hypovolemic shock with bleeding, and that's often the case. However, hypovolemic shock is due to a loss of fluid, regardless of whether that's hemorrhagic or otherwise. You respond to the patient with the following vitals. Heart rate of 112, BP of 116 over 70, with a respiratory rate of 28. What stage of shock are they? If you watch this video all the way through, you should know that that is compensated shock. So how do we know it's compensated shock? So many of those vitals are abnormal. Heart rate's going up and respiratory rate's going up. That's exactly why it's compensated shock. The body's maintaining that 116 over 70. So the patient's stroke volume may be dropping, but the heart rate's making up the difference, which is maintaining the blood pressure, and the respiratory rate's increasing because the body has a demand for oxygen that it wasn't able to meet with its normal vitals. In the next four videos, we're going to look at the types of shock that fall into these four categories. We're also going to look at the primary assessment, secondary assessment, and treatment. But in the meantime, let's recap. Today we learned there's four categories of shock, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive, and obstructive. Today we also learned that a patient in shock is really on a spectrum and they move from compensated to decompensated to irreversible. I hope this video helped. If you have any ideas or suggestions, leave it in the comment box and let's remember we're all on the same team so let's leave it positive.